Welcome to Imagine Otherwise, the podcast about the people and projects bridging art, activism, and academia to build better worlds. Episodes offer in-depth interviews with creators who use culture for social justice and explore the nitty-gritty work of imagining otherwise. I'm your host, Kathy Hanneback. What happens when a biomedical engineer and a literary studies scholar set out to produce a podcast about academia, culture, and social justice across the STEM humanities divide? That's exactly what my guests today on the show, Elizabeth Wayne and Christine Yao, have been doing for the past four and a half years with Ph. Divas. Elizabeth Wayne is an award-winning biomedical engineer, TED Fellow, speaker, and advocate for women in higher education. She's an assistant professor of chemical and biomedical engineering at Carnegie Mellon University, and her current research uses microphages to deliver therapeutic genes to solid tumors. Elizabeth is a strong advocate for women in science and entrepreneurship. She's been a chief organizer in the Conference for Undergraduate Women in Physics, and in 2017, she was featured in Super Cool Scientists, a women in science coloring book. Her co-host on PhD Divas is Christine Zain Yao, who's in a lecture in American Literature to 1900 at the University College London. Her book, Disaffected, The Cultural Politics of Unfeeling in 19th Century America, is under contract with Duke University Press, and her scholarly essays have appeared in J19, Occasion, and American Quarterly. Zine's interests include affect studies through critical race and ethnic studies, queer of color critique, history of science, and the question of solidarity in relation to comparative racialization. She's a judge for the Orwell Prize for Political Fiction, and her research has been supported by grants from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. In our interview, Liz, Zine, and I chat about what it's like to produce an academic podcast as a form of public scholarship, much like Imagine Otherwise, the transnational and discipline-specific ecology of social justice activism, why the future of academia is public engagement, and how building spaces for folks to thrive is how Liz and Zine imagine otherwise. Thanks so much for being with us today. Hi, it's great to be here. Yeah, no, I'm very excited. As soon as I saw your emails, like, oh, yes, oh, my God, imagine otherwise. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I can always tell when Zine's excited because she messages me on multiple platforms. So <laughs> like, did you see it? Are you are you going to see Twitter first or should I WhatsApp you or should I email you first? Let's just do all three. And I'm like, OK, she's really excited. <laughs> so a lot of our listeners are already big fans of yours and of your fantastic podcast that you co-host, PH Divas. But I know we do have some newer listeners who might be new to your show or unfamiliar with it. So before we dive into some of the details, I'd love for you just to give a little bit of a brief overview of what is your podcast all about? So our tagline is that PH Divas is a podcast about academia, culture, and social justice across the STEM humanities divide. And I think we've been doing this for at least five years now, actually. Four and a half. We're getting close to five. We should do something special. Yeah. What got you too interested in podcasting in general? And then what made you want to co-host a show together? Because that's a whole other thing, right? (laughs) Um, This is always a very funny story because... We got interested in podcasting through a friend and mostly Zion got interested in podcasting and then said, Liz, will you do this with me? So, <laughs> so you can, if, if the story isn't right, Zion, you can tell me sometimes history makes me want to embellish, you know, how things happened. Mm-hmm. But um, let's just say that Zion and I first met when we were graduate students at Cornell and we were both uh, graduate resident fellows in a student dorm. So we were living with the students and we also would you know, eat with them. And it just kind of happened organically that we'd all be sitting together and students would have these interesting questions and we would have these interesting clapbacks. I mean, not clapbacks. I mean, they thought they were clapbacks, but they were more like, well, actually, this is how the world works. Um, and so we ended up being a really good pair because Zion, like, is like a human dictionary and like a human <laughs> Wikipedia. And I, you know, know a lot of STEM stuff. And, and then we just kind of verged on that spectrum. One day, Zion was actually on a local Cornell radio show talking, and I was like in the middle of an experiment. So I was like tuning in. So I had I had like 30 minutes between an incubation. And she was talking, and I kept texting her. And then I had to tell her, hey, Zion, I can hear me texting you. Can you turn off your phone? <laughs> You're on the radio right now. Guilty. Um, 
but it really led into, we, we have good conversations. We think there's value in this. And then the friend said, well, why don't you guys do a podcast? And then he actually, um, Dexter Thomas, shout out to Dexter, actually um, produced our first podcast. And then the rest is history. And I think it's so, so appropriate that it happened while you're incubating, because really the true thing that was <laughs> incubating was our collaboration. The way I like thinking about the conversations we had was sort of like we were tag teaming each other, both in terms yeah. of like our, our energy as well as our knowledge bases. And I feel like that's a lot of our dynamic, actually. Um, yeah. And it's sort of interesting to me that I guess even that initial radio moments was probably indicative of the sort of interest play collaboration that we we're doing. Cause on the one hand, it was about you doing your science and having, and having this moment and doing your science. And the reason why I was on the radio is because of uh, this particular uh, graduate student reading grant that I got with uh, a number of other collaborators about Asian American studies. And we're typically talking about anti-blackness in um, Asian America, generally um, talking about fresh off the boat at the time. And so there's oh, sort of this yeah. wonderful confluence yeah. of the way that we were both, it was both us working as graduate students, as well as the topics at the same time coming together. I really yeah. love that kind of interdisciplinary dialogue and relationship that you have, because you cover a whole range of topics. And we can talk about maybe favorite episodes in a minute. But yeah, you really do both bring your individual scholarly expertise, as well as your personal interests and, and uh, backgrounds to bear on these topics. And it's one of the things that I think makes the podcast particularly rich. What got, what do you find particularly productive or even just fun about that kind of interdisciplinary conversation? <laughs> you know, sometimes I wonder what Zion gets out of this because, <laughs> <laughs> because for me, you know, I'm, I'm a scientist who really thinks we need the humanities. I think any scientist who tries to take out the human of their research is just being very dense. You know, science is political. Science is definitely racist at times and, and sexist. And, and we have bias, you know, just because we can, you know, measure something plus or minus, you know, a certain percentage doesn't mean that how we shape our questions or who gets to answer those questions don't matter. So I like being able to talk design because I get to talk about that aspect of my life, my personality, and, and how that, that infiltrates. And so on the other side, I'm wondering, like, do you want to know about cancer? <laughs> do you, like, what do you, so like, you know, what, what can I tell you as a humanities person um, about how science works? And I guess that might be the benefit of just knowing like, what's it like on the other side of the, the mm -hmm. PhD, like the experience of a PhD. And I, I think a lot of our earlier episodes were literally debunking um, what we thought about the other respective like disciplines and seeing that we mm -hmm. actually had more in common in the struggle. Yeah. And to just sort of back that up, I, I sort of find that very funny how Liz said she wonders what I got out of it because I sort of worry about that on, on my side as well. <laughs> um, so I'm someone who also works on like history of science and medicine. So it's so useful to me to know someone who's doing that work currently in the field as opposed to the way that that work become can become abstracted, particularly because I work on it in the 19th century. But also I think that there's this aspect interdisciplinarity which doesn't get emphasized enough, which is simply the social aspect of being around people from other disciplines, which isn't so easily instrumentalized towards the type of actionable goals or outcomes that the neoliberal university wants us to have. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I think in that regard, like the, the sort of collaboration that we're, we're doing is so important in this moment where the university is becoming more and more corporatized in all different parts of the world, me being currently based in the UK. And the way that Universities often, or higher education in general, relies on a sort of divide and conquer tactic, pitting disciplines against each other, particularly STEM and the humanities, based on the sort of idea that we'll have opposing ideologies and it's easier to sort of splinter any sort of efforts to make change in the university, be it for labor conditions for our students, for ourselves, for um, cleaning staff, and the way that really we should all be in this together. And I think that's really informative. And also scientists are fun to talk to. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah i would say that so our friend circles when at least when we were in the same uh, geographic location our friend circles also started to merge so um she wasn't just talking with me she was also talking with you know other people that were in my lab so you know, that was that was interesting but you know the other thing happened for her where i started to learn more about what other people meant and i also think it's funny because now when i'm in a, a purely scientific space 
And they go, well, what do Eng- what do English PhDs do? How do they actually do research? And I'm like, well, actually, <laughs> <laughs> like I've become that person. Like, actually, this is hard. And actually, you can't just write anything. And, you know, there's a lot of it's just as rigorous, actually, as science. And I'm, mm-hmm. by, you know, I mean, I sound like I'm being condescending. No, no. But I find myself like I continually keep going back to the pressures that scientists uniquely faced in terms of setting up labs, in terms yeah. of, you know, the cost of it, the fact that you all of a sudden you have to have the skills in terms of ma- management, as well as doing science, as well as grant writing, all these things that it seems like people are inadequately prepared for. And reason why, like, it is harder for our STEM colleagues to go on strike because, you know, their mice might die or the fact that uh, oh, nice. I, there's very different financial pressures on them. That doesn't mean that they don't, aren't also concerned about, say, labor issues, but it impacts them very differently yeah you know I so I I just this might be um, along the lines of maybe not my favorite but one of the, one of the really poignant moments early on for me I, I there's this conversation I was having with Zine where she was kind of saying like STEM people have all the money we have all the money and I mm-hmm. thought like we don't have all the money <laughs> we don't I mean we have money but I don't it doesn't go in my pocket or every semester and I didn't know where my funding source was coming from and how that would change. And there was a lot of precarity that got introduced because of that. And so I think being able to talk about like in the ways it looks like we have more money, but we actually don't have that kind of, it's not like we have like exponentially more power because we have more funding because you have to keep that up. You do have to apply for funding constantly. I have to, as a faculty now, I have to make sure all my students are funded and that comes from my grants. And if I don't get grants, you know, that that's negatively impacts not only my students' lives, but my career as well. One of the things that you kind of the ways that you trace the STEM humanities divide through the podcast is by talking about labor issues, like you mentioned. Um, Mm -hmm. And I know some of your particularly recent episodes have talked about the way this has played out in the UK and then connecting it to the US system as well, as well as other countries. Um, And it's just, it's really fascinating to see how labor activism, coalitional activism across campus um, is both enabled in some ways um, by the kind of STEM humanities divide, but also really curtailed in some really kind of concrete ways. And I, I appreciate you addressing that because I think that's that's an element of campus activism that doesn't get talked about very much. And I think um, that on, at least on the humanities side, there tends to be this implicit sense that, oh, we are the ones who are more political and the scientists are trying, are so apolitical and we're so, and it, I think it, we sort of take for granted this implicit ideological line in the sand when it's actually far more complicated. And on the humanities side, especially with organizing we were doing at Cornell be- around, because we were trying to unionize at the time, I felt like it often felt on the humanities side, at least in a sort of simplistic mentality that we had some sort of like moral as well as critical high ground. Yeah. <laughs> That's that's usually the perspective that I, I get, and that's something I used to feel. Um, so an example of this would be that, like, Trayvon Martin, you know, when he was killed, and when all these protests were going in and Black Lives Matter was in Michael Brown, and I would think about, like, how this was on my mind and all I was thinking about, but when I go to my lab, that wasn't what anyone was thinking about. It was like, I felt like I was unsafe and I felt like my future children were unsafe. And it was a huge deal for me. And it wasn't a deal for the scientists. And I kept wondering, well, what do I do about that? And am I kind of being a coward or being untruthful to myself because I am not somehow um, doing something more active? And I really had to think about this idea of what does it mean to be activist and be a scientist? What is What would that look like? And so thinking about how the actual structure of science makes it harder to do certain things. And maybe it's time for scientists to start thinking about what does activism look like for them? So uh, I'm, and I'm, I'm going to over-exaggerate this sign, but let's say that I'm in the humanities. All my, I don't have like homework assignments that I do every day, or I don't have like six hour lab courses that happen at very rigorous time points, maybe I can be out physically doing something because I have the time or, or something. If the time structures are, are different, it means I can do different things or mm-hmm. 
thinking about how I stand out or don't stand out. So I've learned now it's not, it's really simplistic to say that because I'm a, that humanities people are supposed to be more active and vocal, right? Like if I'm an Africana studies major, I'm an English major, I'm some sort of social major, then of course I I can wear t-shirts that have like, you know, the motherland on them and I can do all these things. And I think that's simplistic, but in some ways it's a little more true than the way that I feel, um, policed in my own environments where I have to be careful of what I say or how loudly I say it because I am the only black person or I'm the only person who has the pedagogical knowledge or, you know, this no, this structure of like, what does it mean to be woke? Right. So in a different context, you may hear that all the time, sometimes you don't. But to wrap this up, the point is that I've had to realize that in science, my presence is activism and my presence as in I am still in science. I am in the lab. I am being vocal and I'm not giving up. And that actually it can be just as powerful in terms of fighting the status quo, fighting what we think a scientist should look like as it would be for me to be, um, I don't know, you know, doing some protest on campus. Not to say that I can, but we should allow for activism to look different, especially based on how the structures of our disciplines are and what the social pressures are and what the history is. Yeah, I feel like <laughs> that one of the best long, ways... Of, no, no, I was going to say that one of the best ways I feel like I've seen this framed recently was that there's an ecology of activism that we're not all going to be doing the same types of activism, mm-hmm. but to sort yeah. of realize what roles can we best occupy and the way it works with other roles. Whereas I feel like sometimes there's pressure that we have to do all the things. And, and it all looks the same for everyone. And I, I think that I've felt pressure from humanities where they are out there angry because they think that you're not, that you don't care. They think that you, you know, you're not sacrificing as much as I'm sacrificing. And it's like, that's actually not true. <laughs> I can tell you I sacrifice quite a bit. <laughs> it just gets silenced or it's it's like um, it's its own different structure. And so I think we've also had conversations about this, but how do we support each other in our different disciplines to both explore what activism looks like, the ecology, right, the ecological landscape, support each other, but also not blame each other for thinking that the way I am doing or someone is doing activism is the way that the other people should do activism. I think this connects actually really nicely to what I wanted to talk to you about regarding public scholarship, because so much of the stuff that you talk about on your show, and certainly um, the conversations that I have with folks on this show, um, are about getting kind of research inflected questions or scholarly inflected ideas Mm -hmm. and research into different audiences, right, into different communities that may not pick up a journal article or may not read that particular kind of journal or that particular field, right? And I think one of the reasons that I started Imagine Otherwise back in 2015, and one of my most exciting, I think, parts of the show has been seeing that range of public intellectual work just increase and increase and increase Mm -hmm. over the years. And I love that. And your show is such a fantastic example of that. I would love to talk with you about where you see public scholarship in the form of podcasting in particular going in the future, or maybe where do you want to see it go? Well, I think it's on the rise. Zion, I'm going to give you a little time to formulate your answer to this. But what I've noticed is that there are more courses popping up about how to podcast, how to actually craft a story. And I think that having faculty who are finally getting the I won't say the courage, but the momentum is building around this idea of podcasting and making stories um, and also producing um, students who enjoy doing that. So I think there's definitely a space for it. I've seen more faculty look at it as less of a fringe thing, kind of like how academic Twitter is a thing now, which I'm not sure is always a good thing because people are just transferring the same negative tone and things we didn't like when it, when it happened in person. They're just putting it online. Anyway. So I think public scholarship is definitely increasing. I think that with the decrease in government funding and the kind of slow but silent shift towards foundation funding, people are trying to grab for that kind of money or attention. And this might be more true for the science side, I'm not sure. But people are making themselves be better communicators. And that means podcasting, I think. And this idea of being a public scholar is going to become more important, I think, more people are trying to do it, but they don't really know what they're doing. And um, I think that's an exciting thing and an opportunity to kind of make a ground, 
make the, make some ground rules of like, how do we do this effectively? Letting people know that this isn't just about pop culture. Or it's not just, um, it's possible to be intellectually rigorous on a social media popular platform. And I think once people really kind of get their heads out of the ivory, um, it will reach its true power. Or what's really going to happen is it's going to become less fringe, and then the mainstream academics will do it. Um, and my fear is that they will overshadow the the women, people of color, um, the queer academics who were really doing this in the beginning. But that's what happens uh, with every new technology. Yes. Ugh. Um, <laughs> So to sort of chime in with some other specifics that really excite me. So I just finished actually being the founding chair for this podcast initiative from C19, the Society of 19th Century Americanists. Um, and I'm really proud of what we did there, which is basically to build a podcast where members with little to no podcasting experience could pitch episodes and that the core team then would help to guide the episode creators whose proposals were accepted into so to be able to make their own podcast. And I think what we're trying to do that was different there is not simply just create a, a core team that would produce the episodes, but then again, create a platform that where we can train people to to put to, to make their podcast ideas become a reality, which I think has been really exciting. And there's a lot of work that we did there that I'm really excited about, particularly this one that help produced by Karitha Mitchell, which is about the use of the N-word and other slurs in the classroom, particularly when you're working at 19th century American texts, like infamously, um, well, I was going to say Uncle Tom's Cabinet, but specifically thinking of Huckleberry Finn and, of course, the use of the N-word there. And I think that really important work is being done there. Another way forward I see is what a friend of mine, uh, Hannah McGregor, has been doing, where she's been trying to work with, where she's been working with Wilfrid Laurier University Press in terms of creating guidelines for what a peer-reviewed podcast would look like. So trying to think of how to get podcasts evaluated as scholarship, as rigorous, that on the one hand, there's a public aspect, but public can also mean potential as scholarship as such. And so those are some things I find particularly hopeful. I'm also hoping that the way forward might be to think about hubs for different types of humanities podcasts or like academic podcasts in general, because I think at the moment, we're doing work separately or there's podcasts that are being created for specific projects. And then those are like sort of one-off things. But if there's perhaps ways that we can better leverage networking across a number of different mm -hmm. projects at once yeah. uh, might be a way to, to band together and create a larger community. The, tra the training is a really interesting element. And I love that initiative. I, I will definitely put a link to that in the show notes. Cause I think that's something that a lot of folks would be interested in because I know just talking to people who are really interested in podcasting and they're like, I would totally do that, except I have no earthly idea where to start. And podcasting right, communities right. beyond academia are really fantastic in a lot of ways. And they're also not fantastic in other ways, right? Like any community, of, I suppose. <laughs> um, and like any new technology, I suppose. And I know that that intimidation factor is something that prevents a lot of folks from getting into podcasting or just seeing if it's something that they would want to try. Um, and so I, I love the idea of giving people a framework and giving people training and giving people an infrastructure where you don't have to learn every single piece of it. You don't have to learn how to edit if you don't want to, but you can. You don't have to learn how to do graphic design for all of the images, but you can. You don't have to learn all of the pieces just to get your foot in the door and see if it's something that you'd be interested in. So I think that's a really great initiative. I think with the, the rise in public intellectual, um, this idea of having being a public intellectual is still very terrifying for many academics. Definitely. And something that I, I noticed as we interviewed people, like let's say we'd have great conversations over coffee, just in person. And then when I say, wow, we should do this on the podcast, it became, oh no, no, <laughs> we're not going to do that because they're afraid of what that might mean for their career. They're afraid of, um, the other aspect of this is that they're afraid of putting themselves out on social media and risking the exposure of trolls of other type of, you know, dangerous sites that could lead to harassment, online harassment. And I think that that particularly was something that was on people's minds of like, how do I protect myself? What if someone comes and attacks me? And overall, I think the benefits of being on the podcast have been good. So even if those are the conversations people conversations that people had before they got on the podcast, afterwards they were saying, you know, people were now talking to me about my research. People were coming up to 
me or I had an interview and someone said, listen to my episode and it helped them understand my work and where I was coming from. So my hope is that people will engage with this more, not only as I said, we make more tools, but we also try to uh, academify. Is that a word? So that's a word now. <laughs> but we're going to as we try to make that more of an academically acceptable process, more people will engage, but it can also serve as a platform for them to talk about their ideas in a way that's more conversational than a peer reviewed article will be, because I don't think they're really meant to be conversational. They're meant to be terse and academic and intellectual, right? And very compact pieces of, of work. So I think it'll be exciting to see how that happens and also training about what to expect, what not to expect. And then, what does it mean to get over that fear of putting yourself and your work, which is really like your work is really yourself, putting that online in a context where you don't have control over it anymore. So, and also this is very deeply, ge- sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say um, very deeply gendered. In fact, I was surprised mm-hmm. that um, at the end of last year, I saw someone tweet about that. They saw that there was a sort of shift um, in terms of blogs to podcasts in doing public scholarship and in their opinion they thought it was very gender because they thought blogs were where women or like I guess um, more gender minorities sort of gravitate to as a medium whereas like podcasts in their opinion was much more bro as a medium and that really surprised me because I can understand the public perception that podcasts are, are sort of a bro- seen as a bro thing and sort of the joke about getting a bunch of guys together but personally when I think of academic podcasts I think of so many ones that are run by by women or gender minorities, I thought I was like, wait, what about Imagine Otherwise? What about us as PhD of us? What about like so many other podcasts I can think of? And the ones that come to mind are none of the ones that are run by men, personally. But anyway, it has been really fun over the past several years to see the kind of growth of feminist podcast communities or women's podcast communities, and those don't always mm-hmm. align for sure in the same way they don't always <laughs> align in, in other <laughs> realms. Um, but there and. Um, I'm thinking of She Podcast, for example, which is a really vibrant community. They just had a conference that was pretty fantastic. And a lot of those communities have arisen in response to the broing of podcasting, right? And so like, if you follow po- a major mainstream podcast news or industry podcast news, which are two really different forms of, of media representation, which is kind of interesting, but a lot of it is men talking about stuff. And there's often a technology focus to it, an emphasis on analytics, an emphasis on advertising. My God, the advertising conversation is <laughs> absurd. Um, and like, how do I make money on this? How do I make money on this? How do I make money on this? And there are all these people of color podcasters, queer podcasters, feminist podcasters, women podcasters who are like, dude, we have way other concerns <laughs> about all the kinds of stuff than these conversations. Um, and certainly those kinds of more social justice podcasting communities or minority podcasting communities have really expanded over the past couple of years. And it's been really exciting. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm excited about it. And it, it, it's something that I would argue for both of us keeps us going and keeps us doing the podcast because we recognize how important it is. <laughs> uh, have you ever experienced any like sense of fandom from your podcast? Like when you meet someone who listens to yep, it? Yep. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and it I, it really shocks me because in there's a small corner of my mind that still thinks that I'm just putting this out into the you know the abyss of the internet, but no one's really looking, right? No one's really saying. And now uh, there's actually have been some moments where I've been around colleagues and someone will mention, oh, Liz has a podcast, and they're like, and they pull out their phone and they look it up, and I'm like, oh no. Don't do, this. <laughs> don't do this it's a really different kind Most, of attention right than we're used to in academia because yeah. like not a whole lot of people are like oh my god you wrote that amazing journal article that <laughs> revolutionized the world right i mean it may be hopefully. sometimes sometimes yeah. sure but yeah. yeah well i had this funny story of um when i When I became a TED fellow um, and I was working with someone and they said, oh, I've listened to your podcast. I was like, oh, that's great. And then he said that he listened to, um, I guess what I'm, to make this shorter, when people say they listen to my podcast, I'm now terrified because they seem to remember the ones where I said something like innuendo-ish or like really interesting, like 
one faculty when I was a postdoc said, oh, I listened to your episode about Nicki Minaj. I'm like, no. <laughs> I mean, it's not bad, but it's like, you know, it's, it's not, that's our first conversation. Like, I don't know which part, I don't know what you think about Nicki Minaj. Right? And I stand by what I said, but <laughs> it was interesting. It's that thing of like, <laughs> we don't get to control how our, how our work is received, right? Which is unnerving in a lot of ways, but comes with the territory, I suppose. So I'm curious what kind of new projects you two have coming up, either together through the podcast or individually. Zion has this cool project that I'm secretly, privately, openly following her on. (laughs) Well, I guess in in terms of my research, um, there's one big research project I have uh, working on, which is, of course, my first book. And then there's the the project that like people are really excited about who are not in my field. Um, So I'll, I'll start with... I'll start with the one that is supposed to be more important for my career, which I also really care about, um, which is, so I, I was really lucky at the end of, near the end of last year, I got my book contract with Duke University Press for uh, my book manuscript, Disaffected, the, the Cultural Politics of Unfeeling in 19th Century America, where I'm theorizing unfeeling as a type of racialized and queer form of disaffection from the culture of sentiment and thinking about the ways that too quickly do we respond to allegations of unfeeling, particularly when it's being wielded as a weapon against minoritized people as, no, but we have feelings just like them, or like or like like the dominant group of people. You know, it's like proving that through literature we see that, oh, they thought that they didn't feel the same way, but no, we're just, they have the same hearts as everyone else. And instead by saying like, wait a second, rather than having to make the move of saying that you have feelings like everyone else, how about we sort of recognize the way that unfeeling can be a type of resistance or a type of survival mechanism. And so I'm looking at racialized and queer forms like frigidity, like oriental inscrutability, like what I call unsympathetic blackness, and thinking (laughs) about the way that it offers like alternative ways of thinking about change and ambivalence and complicated feelings. And in some ways, this actually grows out of collaborations I've been having with colleagues like Liz, where we talk about the emotional armor that we have or or the way that we have to suspend our feelings to get through certain situations. And rather than vilifying those moments, I think that if we sort of recognize the sort of work that that does and perhaps the way that it opens up new possibilities that doesn't don't have to just continually appeal to dominant feelings, that actually allows us to think differently about types of change in the world. So that's like my, my main project, and it's in 19th century American literature. But I'm hoping to open up conversations and modes of thinking that I hope will be useful for a lot of people who are interested in critical race and ethnic studies, affect studies, um, queer theory, and queer color critique. And so that's my that's my big project. But the one that people are particularly excited about, particularly no, we're excited about non humanities affected. Yeah, well, but, but I guess the one that's more Im- perhaps immediately exciting is this article I'm working on for, about Avatar: The Last Airbender, which is the greatest show of all time. Greatest show of all time. <laughs> Yeah, we'll fight people um, on this. I will also fight people on this, but <laughs> it's a, a Nickelodeon show. But what I'm looking at the show for is the way that allows us to think about relationships between Asian and Indigenous people and indeed thinking about Asian indigeneity in ways I think are really under-recognized and thinking about on a global scale, the way that if we suspend whiteness because Avatar The Last Airbender presents us a world without whiteness, how do we pay attention to the way that, say, Asian colonialism and Asian North American settler colonials that operate the way that indigeneity operates in what we call Turtle Island, but also indigeneity, which is under-recognized within Asia. And I think that the show allows us to think more capaciously and perhaps more critically about the ways that these dynamics are often occluded when we have these conversations that often over-represents European white uh, colonialism and its aftermath, which of course is very formative, but at the same time, I think obscures the complexity of some of these other conversations we should be having. Very cool. And for me, a new project... I'm in a growing phase right now, like in a hermit phase where I'm actually um, built, starting my lab. I just started my research position, my faculty position uh, in August. So I'm recruiting students, um, literally putting together my lab and writing grants. So I will be in a hole. I always feel like I'm in a hole of some sort, but I'm going to be in a creative hole, which even though it's not a new up and coming project, it's very important maybe just to remind people that there are phases where you are showing off your work in phases where you are um, allowing yourself to think and uh, live in the space of opportunity. 
So this brings me to my last and my absolute favorite question that I get to talk with folks at that really gets at the <laughs> the heart behind the show, the reason why I started that this. And that's your version of a better world, that world that you work towards when you record the podcast, when you teach your classes, when you put together your labs, when you do your research and your writing. So I'll ask you this ginormous question that I think we don't get enough opportunities to answer, particularly when we have to spend a lot of our time fighting against things. So Mm -hmm. what's the world that you're working towards? What kind of world do you want? So since I've been in the UK for a year now, it's really interesting to see how the terrain of what how imagining change differs given geographical location. Like UK academia looks so different from both American and, and Canadian academia. And what I'm working on there is just trying to make space for other scholars of color. I was not prepared for how much wider that space is. There's only, at the beginning of last year, there was a study that came out that there's only 25 Black women who are full professors in any discipline in the UK, for instance. I'm the first and only faculty member of color in my department. And so for me, one type of change I'm trying to work on is finding other scholars of any level and trying to connect connect us together so we can try to survive this and try to make it a space where we can thrive. And I feel like this is really the long-term project that I have with a couple other friends over the next couple of decades is just trying to make this space more livable for us. And so this is not quite the the horizon of absolute ambition in terms of overall change, but that is something I would like to see. Mm. I think mine is very similar. I want people to feel empowered by what they study and what they do. And I want people to self-explore and feel like fulfilled. And that sounds very broad, but when I think about how much time people spend in academia, reading, learning about people that we've never known before. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm just thinking about how everyone knows about Isaac Newton. Okay, physics people know about Isaac Newton. Engineers know Isaac Newton, but we don't know this person really. Um, and so when we get to like explore ourselves and explore our own communities and see, be able to make those connections back and have that be received as a mainstream acceptable idea. And so when I'm thinking about the world I want to create, I start with my lab, I start with my students and trying to get them to see the bigger picture and what they're a part of. And I want them to really think about what new knowledge they can create, not just in terms of, I don't know, this is what we're going to study in this Petri dish, but this is why this Petri dish matters to me and the world. And I'm going to spend my time articulating that, my articulating my importance in the world and having it be valid, valid and welcomed. I think those are both really amazing visions <laughs> and intertwine in really, really kind of significant they are. ways. Mm-hmm. Well, I just want to say thank you both so much for joining me on the podcast and sharing all of the ways that you imagine and create otherwise. Yeah, thank Thank you you. so much, Kathy. Thanks for listening to another episode of Imagine Otherwise. Imagine Otherwise is produced by Ideas on Fire, and this episode was created by me, Kathy Hanneback. You can check out the show notes for this episode on our website at ideasonfire.net where you can also read about our fabulous guests, as well as find links to the people and projects we discussed on the show.